For the final time this year, we visit with GOP political strategist Matt Mikowiak. Matt, good morning. How are you? I'm doing great, Chad. Good morning. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, Big week for the Republicans in D.C. as far as tax reform goes. Looks like they're going to get this one through, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, the one concern that's out there is the Senate, because you have Corker, who said he was going to flip and vote for the bill on Thursday or Friday, Bob Corker of Tennessee, who's retiring, and he has since then um, been dealing with some blowback from a provision that appears to benefit real estate LLCs, which would benefit him. Now, I, I tend to think he was probably not involved. He's not on the conference committee. But it looks certainly looks bad, so he has written a letter to Senator Hatch, the Finance Committee Chair in the Senate. Uh, so it'll be interesting to watch whether he had such you know serious concern that ultimately this you know flips his vote. Because keep in mind uh, that then the margin is really narrow, and with McCain in Arizona recuperating, um, you know they may they may they may end up needing Corker's vote. So I think it's going to be really close. My guess is it does get through the Senate. I think it's going to pass the House tomorrow. They're going to go first. But the question is, what does Corker do? Uh, because the other issue is Susan Collins. Um, she wants a couple health care-related uh, votes to happen before the conference committee. They, she, she's demanding that they pass the end-of-year spending bill, which is going to have reinsurance and uh, CSR payments funded. These are the subsidies for uh, low-income plans in Obamacare. She wants those things done before the tax bill gets over on. I know this is complicated, but keep in mind, three Republican senators can block this. And if you don't have McCain, if Corker flips, and if Collins won't vote yet, vote yes, that's a path to not passing it in the Senate. Again, I think there's enough momentum. They're going to find a way to do it. Uh, they know the clock is ticking. Uh, but, it, you know, it's, it's one to watch, certainly this week. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And l- let me just ask you on a, you know, kind of, I guess, a personal level for John sure. McCain. Why doesn't he just retire? I, I mean, he's got, obviously with this with this diagnosis. I mean, I hate to say that it's a death sentence, but it's from everything I've read, it's as close to one as you can get. Why would you want to spend any more time in Washington D.C.? And if you're missing votes, important votes because of your health, why not just retire and and have the governor appoint someone to 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 represent the people in Arizona? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, it's a sensitive question. Look, the decision to retire or resign is a deeply personal one for anyone who's in elected office. And for someone like McCain, who's been there, I think, since 1986, although it might be more like 1982, whatever it is, he's been there 30 years. The decision to leave is a hard one to make, right? You get used to being a United States senator. I know that sounds a little crazy, but you get used to the influence you have, the effect you have to help your state and your country, the issues that you become an expert on and have real influence on. And my sense is he actually wasn't convinced this was uh, a death sentence initially. It sounds like maybe in the last week or, th- week or so things have taken a turn for the worst. And so, you know, that said, I don't, I don't necessarily think he's, he's um, you know, near death uh, necessarily. There, there was some discussion in the last 24 hours that he would return to Washington if they needed his vote and that he expects to be back in January. So, look, it's a good question. I mean, I think there's, there, there was a Washington Post story over the weekend about how many how there's more uh, senators over the age of 80 than at any time in the history of the United States Senate. I don't think that's a good thing. Um, I don't think an 80- or 85- or 90-year-old person can represent their state with as much vigor and energy and focus and determination as someone who's younger. Uh, and I don't know why these people want to stay up there for 30 or 40 years. If you spent even a year in Washington, uh, you know it's not a place you want to be for a long time. So um, I, I don't know why you know he, he's making that decision. It's a deeply personal one, and my, my guess is that the, this latest turn was fairly sudden. Yeah, I just you know, and I'm not meaning let's you know throw them out and force them out. It's just if it sure. were me, I would I would hope my thought would be I want to spend as much time in Arizona or you know around family and friends as possible. But yeah, you get into a different frame of mind uh, if you've been there for thirty years, I guess. Uh, let's talk about a uh, another senator, and that's Senator Ted Cruz. Uh, yeah. After what happened in Alabama, it, it was almost a coordinated uh, barrage of stories that came out uh, from left-leaning publications that Ted Cruz is in trouble, that uh, Beto O'Rourke can do this, that he can take out uh, Ted Cruz because Cruz's approval rating is somewhere around 38 to 40% in Texas. Is there really any danger in Ted Cruz losing that Senate seat? I don't see that. I really don't. I mean, as I sit here now, I think Cruz is likely to win the Senate seat by at least eight percentage points. Look, you got to remember, um, it's going to take twenty million dollars probably to run a credible U.S. Senate campaign, general election statewide, and with with, with federal limits at twenty seven hundred dollars per person. 
that takes an awful lot of money. And so O'Rourke, you know, I will give him credit. He's been working hard going around the state for six months now. Um, but he still has pretty low name ID. I saw a poll of, of, of Democrats that a friend of mine took in Houston, and he was um, this person who was not well known in Houston was better known than, than Beto O'Rourke does in this particular congressional district. So I think he's probably still at 10 percent name ID statewide. So the point of that is. He's got to raise big money to be credible. And the problem that Tory work has is the Texas Senate seat is probably the 14th most competitive Senate race in 2018. You've got 10 Democrats running from states that Trump won last November that are up for re-election. You add to that Arizona and Nevada, that's 12. Those are competitive Republican seats. You add to that Tennessee where they recruited a former governor, a moderate former Democratic governor of Tennessee. Those 13 states are all going to get far more national money than Texas is because it's just not going to be competitive. So... You know, we'll see. O'Rourke's an interesting candidate. He's a little bit different than your, than your normal Democrat, but I think he's far too liberal for Texas. And so, ultimately, I, I don't think it's going to be competitive, and I don't think he's going to have the money to make it competitive. And going into next year, midterm elections, if if Republicans can actually get tax reform done, uh, I know there's a couple stories out about Democrats being, you know, these are all generic ballots, generic polls. Uh, yeah. that the Democrats are 11 points better than Republicans right now. How much stock do you put into those polls right now, and does that change if Republicans are able to prove to people you're going to have more money in your pockets? Yeah, I mean, keep in mind, we're halfway to the midterms, right? Think about how much things have changed in the last year. They're going to change that much a year from now when the midterms happen. You know, generic polls are kind of useful in the, in the, in the medium term, you know, sort of in the middle of a race when you don't know who's running for which seats. But keep in mind, every election is a choice between two candidates, and those Candidates have strengths and weaknesses, and they run good campaigns or bad campaigns, and those things matter. I mean, think about how much it mattered in Alabama. I mean, you could have run almost any other Republican in Alabama, and they would have won, and Roy Moore you know, underperformed Trump by almost 30% one year later. So, um, I, you know, I do put some stock in it only in the sense that if you look at historically, yes, the generic ballot is as bad for Republicans as it's ever been, and that, that, is, that should be very concerning. That said, to your second question, yes, I think tax reform is going to help. I really do. Look, the Republicans have put a huge wager on this tax reform bill. If it doesn't work, if people don't feel more money in their pockets, if it doesn't lead to higher economic growth and more hiring, if it doesn't lead to more investment, uh, they're going to pay a political price for that. There's no question. But I I do believe that's going to happen. We've already had two quarters this year of 3% economic growth. And you're going to see paychecks uh, larger for people who have their taxes withheld starting in February. They're going to be higher uh, than, than paychecks before that, and that's going to lead to consumer spending. So I think things can get better, but certainly there are some warning signs out there. Republicans have to take this very seriously, um, and they have to um, you know, continue to move a legislative agenda. They've got to get the spending bill done by the end of the year. I think they're going to make another run of health care, perhaps infrastructure. Uh, we'll, we'll see where they go you know, next year. It's going to be tougher, and, of course, we're going to have one fewer U.S. Senate seat to deal with because of the Alabama race. So the margin is going to be two instead of three. Yeah. All right, Matt, uh, tell folks where they can sign up for your morning newsletter and your uh, latest podcast. Yeah, newsletter. Uh, we send out a, an email newsletter for Texas uh, every weekday morning called Must Read Texas. You can sign up at mustreadtexas.com or mrtsignup.com. Uh, the podcast is called Mac on Politics. Uh, we're almost at 60 episodes now. We've had senators and congressmen and ambassadors and all kinds of people on there. The latest episode is with Sal Russo, who's a co-founder of the Tea Party Express and who was an aide to Ronald Reagan. You can find that in the iTunes store, on Google Play, Stitcher, and on the web at maconpolitics.com. Very good. Matt, uh, appreciate you joining us this year, and uh, Merry Christmas. We'll visit with you in January. Always a pleasure. You guys have a great holiday season. Merry Christmas. All right, you too. Thank you. That's Matt McCoviak, Chad Hasty Show, KFYO.